Hello there, and thank you for joining us today. My name is A. David Lewis, and I'm speaking to you from Worcester, Massachusetts, the MCPHS University campus. I am delighted to have uh, two wonderful guests with me today here to respond to student questions and perhaps if there's time, questions from the viewership uh, on the subject of cancer and comic books. This has been uh, material that we have been studying here at MCPHS University this semester and I'm delighted to say we'll be continuing this fall. Before I introduce uh, my guests, I'd like to briefly give some background on the course itself, particularly the course description as students came to understand it. This course uh, examines the popular and personal visualizations of illness as mediated through graphic novels and sequential art. Students will be exposed to reading strategies and interpretations of these works, to background on these creators, and to their experiences of living with cancer. At its core, this course is as much an exploration as it is an experiment. That is, the graphic novels being read, the book chapters being absorbed and the instructor input being offered largely operate as data points. The trend or path for this area of study remains at this moment unknown. While provocative and plentiful, the intersection of cancer and comics is still a frontier to be mapped and a synergy to be fully evaluated. As we get into uh, my discussion with our guests, I'll get into some of the texts that we use, but I don't want to keep them waiting uh, any longer. I first of all would uh, like to introduce uh, MK and I'm going to uh, do her name as best as I can obviously. MK Sirwick, uh, she is coming to us directly from uh, her home in Chicago. MK is a nurse right. who uses comics to reflect on the complexities of illness and caregiving. She is the artist in residence at Northwestern Medical School, where she earned a master's degree in medical humanities and bioethics. MK is also a guest cartoonist for the Mayo Clinic Center for Innovation with Dr. Ian Williams, who we'll get to in just a moment. She co-curates graphicmedicine.org and is the co-author of the Graphic Medicine Manifesto from Penn State University Press published 2015. She just completed her first graphic memoir, Taking Turn, Stories from Unit 371. You can see some of her work at www.comicnurse.com. MK, thank you for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. And a tr on the road, uh, we have Dr. Ian Williams. Uh, I'd like to assure everyone Ian is not driving. He is being shuttled uh, to Manchester, England by car, but he has been so kind enough to join us. Ian, uh, Dr. Williams, is a physician, comics artist, and writer based in Brighton, UK. After training in medicine, he took postgraduate studies in fine art and then an MA in medical humanities. He's taught at both medical schools and art schools, and he's written book chapters, scholarly papers for various journal and articles for broadsheet newspapers. He also started making comics under the nom de plume Tom Ferrier in 2007, but he's since reverted to using his real name. Uh, his debut graphic novel, The Bad Doctor, was published by Myriad Editions uh, in 2014. I should mention that he's also a member of the advisory board for the International Health Humanities Network, a council member of the Association of Medical Humanities and a joint series editor uh, for a forthcoming book series from Penn State University that I believe uh, the Graphic Medicine Manifesto was in fact part of. But let me also mention uh, that Ian has a weekly strip in the Guardian newspaper called Sick Notes. Ian, hello from the road. Thank you for being with us today. Hello, hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Cut Thank out. You. Oh, yeah, that's good. Sorry, this is slightly crazy. Um, broadcasting from a car, but uh, it's well, normal it, anyway. But thanks for having me. 
If you cut out, we'll just know that you'll come back and reconnect with us shortly. I'm glad that you're yeah. staying safe as you're doing this, and it's a pleasure to have yeah. you both here. Thanks. Now, um, what largely predicated uh, this time today, this video Q&A, was that after several weeks of looking at comic books and cancer, uh, your graphic medicine manifesto was serving as one of our textbooks, the other textbook being The Emperor of All Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee. Uh, we've been looking at a number of graphic novels and a number of comic books and examining how cancer is presented, how the cancer experience is presented, uh, and what the takeaway might be from this intersection between illness and media. I a medium. I asked my students to pose some questions to the two of you as the authorities at Graphic uh, Medicine, and here's part of what they came up with. The first question comes from Alan Ibrahim, who asks, Dear Mr. Williams, Dr. Williams, and uh, Ms. Uh, Sirwick, my main question for both of you, what do you think is the future of graphic medicine. Are courses like cancer and comic books going to become more and more common in the next decade? And why do you think it's taken so long for this method of teaching and expressing medical information to catch on in a big way? Uh, Alan also mentions, huge fan of all the essays in the book. Thank you for contributing to it. So Alan is very future focused here on what we're doing now in my classroom and in classrooms uh, across the country. Uh, what do you see its trajectory being? Do you see it expanding? Uh, do you see it uh, leveling off? What is the future of both your organization, specifically graphic medicine, and this study overall between comics and healthcare? Hello. Well. I kind of feel it's just started. It's just started to kick off. Um, and uh, as to why it's only just got, you know, people have only just started using comics, well, um, when MK and I first started corresponding, um, around about 2007, I guess, when I sort of started to the website, um, it, it and then when we created a, a conference in 2010, uh, we got the idea that there was lots of people here and there sort of starting to look at comics um, as a medium for thinking about healthcare, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody was working in little separate pockets. And then when we put out the call for papers for the first conference, we just got this kind of deluge of, of, of people obviously interested in this area, but um, hadn't really connected with anybody else who was interested and so um, we felt that this critical mass was building up and then since then I suppose um, I, well I feel that graphic medicine has created a focus for um, all these people working in different locations with different interests to get together and the conferences have been absolutely amazing so I feel it's just beginning um, as to why it's taken this long for people to, to start using comics, I think that's partially a um, feature of uh, the, the cultural positioning of comics. Um, comics go in and out of fashion. Comics were traditionally have, have been sort of, if you like, frowned upon as a sort of rather juvenile medium and then at times they've been sort of uh, in fashion and uh, people have started looking at them and then they've died back again. And comics are on the up at the moment, I think. We've discussed in the class that uh, part of the power or the access of comics may come from its status of originating as a fringe medium. Uh, that yeah. is to say, another medium that's been under greater scrutiny or more intensive, um, more intensive study may not have been able to expand in the way that comics has across so many genre and into the medical sciences. Uh, MK, would you like to add to that and, and perhaps anything in your experience regarding its move 
into the classroom as well. Uh, yeah, I have a, a couple of thoughts. First of all, just picking up on what you said, sort of the underground tradition of comics, mm. I think that's to the benefit of the work and the conversation around health and illness. You know, Ian and I are both grounded in the medical humanities. And, you know, one of the goals of medical humanities is to cast sort of a, the tools of each of the disciplines in the humanities, but also a critical eye um, at what happens in healthcare. And that marries perfectly with the underground tradition of showing us things that have been stigmatized. Um, and that, I think, is to the benefit of the conversation around health and illness because so many aspects of health and illness are stigmatized, things we're not you know, normally looking at in popular culture, things like the dying process, disability, um, caregiving, which generally, you know, we have, at least here in the States, this myth of autonomy. And the caregiving relationship busts that open and shows that we all at one time in our life will be dependent, and we all most of our lives actually are dependent on others. But in caregiving, that's so concrete. And when we can have these kinds of books that focus on and literally show you know, the, the caring relationships between people, the stigmatized things like disability. Um, I think that benefits the conversation about health and illness a great deal. As for the future, you know, Ian and I spent a, a quite a bit of time last month really kind of trying to strategize some things around that. And I think uh, a couple of areas that we're, we're quite keen on is um, looking across cultures and being able to facilitate more of a conversation across cultures because right now our site is limited to the English language but there's certainly work happening all over the world as Ian mentioned that we hear about from our conferences and through the site in different languages and we hope to um, kind of expand our ability to communicate thanks to our partners all over the world and um, and also and then in terms specifically to your question of the classroom um, you know I, I been visiting classrooms and Ian visit classrooms and it, it really amazes me the sophistication of the level at which people are having conversations around these books and I, I'd love to think that that will absolutely continue. Um, and even on the undergraduate level I just came for some classes at Duke and the level of conversation around these books and across media um, and images and medicine and all of these ways in which that I hadn't even thought about the ways these books are contributing to conversations around health. I'd, I'd love to think that's on the upswing. Now, our next question is sort of in the same vein, but it takes a slightly different uh, focus. This one is from Kara Ann Hartnett. She's also focused on the future of graphic medicine, but she uh, centers it on one particular, uh, as I said, focus. Do you ever see graphic in the medicine being used as a teaching tool in hospitals, such as doctors, PAs, and nurses, will recommend patients to read graphic medicine books on the type of illness that they have. Uh, Cara uh, Ann adds, I think this would be a very useful tool that can be translated to many languages for patient education. Can, could the, either of you speak to, whether it's in the context of cancer or other illnesses, uh, doctors, PAs, healthcare workers, having comics in their toolbox uh, as part of their arsenal for patient care. Um, I'll start on that one. I think we might have just lost Ian. Um, yeah, he'll be back. Yeah, he'll be back. But I know that, you know, he and I have had conversations on all these topics, so we, you know, we, we've had these conversations. One of the things that he and I both agree and any provider, so healthcare provider, professional who's working in comics and medicine and familiar with the text, will say that many of these books um, are certainly not appropriate um, for people who are living with those conditions. Um, mm -hmm. And Ian has some interesting examples uh, of situations in which you wouldn't necessarily recommend, for example, a book like Epileptic to someone who just was diagnosed with a seizure disorder. You know, some of them are, again, from the underground traditions of comics, can be somewhat dark and might not be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends. The ultimate answer I think I'm arriving at is it depends on the book. Um, and, you know, in studying cancer comics specifically, you, you probably have discussed this or thought about this if you are diagnosed with cancer and you're given one of these books, what's the number one thing you're going to look at? Did the person survive? Yeah. Narrative resolution in these issues is incredibly important. Um, I had a friend diagnosed with cancer 
and I uh, certainly was eager to have, because she was someone who studies literature and was very aware of some of the literature around cancer and, and comics, um, and she found, and actually another scholar I know of who's diagnosed with cancer said there were certain things in the book she knew were there that she didn't want to look at now because she was diagnosed with it. So I'm thinking particularly of Cancer Vixen, but there's a page in there where Melissa uh, Marchetto uh, does an amazing job, uh, Marissa, sorry, does an amazing job of showing this the graph, if you'll recall, the page where she shows what the, the um, cycle while she's getting her chemo of mm. energy so mm -hmm. she could plan her life. Um, th that obviously is not going to be the same for every pe person with cancer, but it generally gives you the idea that right after you get the chemo, you might be okay, but then you're going to have this huge nadir where you're going to dip in energy, but then you might bounce back right before. You know, and that kind of, for my friend who was a teacher, was helpful to think about, okay, I know what, you know, what my workload can be. Um, so, so there's ways in which they're clinically appropriate. Um, another book that comes to mind that you wouldn't necessarily have read in this class but recently came out was called, yes, the Chemo Energy Flow Chart, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about that. Um, so there's, you know, aspects that might be difficult to read. I know that when I was struggling with my mother's dementia, which was beginning, I really resisted reading Tangles because I was living it. I didn't want to read about it too. Um, so it depends on the individual. It depends on the book. Um, but was, ultimately, was that the newer text you were thinking of? Uh, oh yeah, the newer text that I think is incredibly applicable, and I get excited about these as a nurse. Um, is one called My Degeneration by Peter Dunlap Scholl, and it's about living with Parkinson's. And one of the things I love that he does in there is he gives like helpful tips that he's learned over ten years of struggling with movement disorder that mm -hmm. might be useful and that's the kind of book I think should be in the waiting room of every neurologist and every person, doctor or nurse who deals with Parkinson's. So again, it, the answer, long answer, it depends on the book and it depends on the person and what their needs might be. Let me slide the question uh, to Ian if he's still uh, with us. Ian, uh, one thing that MK put her finger on here is that it's going to depend, as she said, on the patient and on the condition. But what about uh, the patient's loved ones. What about the community around the patient? Could these texts uh, be useful, such as mom's cancer, which comes from the perspective of uh, the son, uh, the son along with the two daughters on their uh, mother's illness. Could these works be just as useful, more useful in um, either comforting or preparing loved ones who are dealing with an illness? I'm not sure if Ian is still connected or if he's reconnecting, so we'll see if he can unmute and respond. Otherwise, yeah. MK, I'll come back to you. Yeah, it seems so. Oh, there he is. There he is. So, uh, so Ian, the question was uh, how useful these texts can be to the loved ones and community of those who might be ill. And even if we can't get you on video, we can still take your answer um, by audio. I think you might be having trouble putting your hearing you, maybe. Okay. Uh, so, MK, let's go back to you just with expanding that question as to uh, these not being used on the patient, but being used for the patient's community and, and network? I think that, again, it's dependent on the person and their needs, but I think absolutely. Um, he certainly, when Brian created Mom's Cancer, he intended that to some degree. He intended, you know, to, to make it something that the people who followed his family would see their experience and, and yeah, as you say, get, even just, you know, I'm thinking of a book called Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant by mm -hmm. Roz Chast and, mm -hmm. and Caring for Her Elder Parents. Sometimes just knowing someone else in the world is going through it and is experiencing the same frustrations and angers and, and sadnesses, just knowing someone else is out there that you read your own experience on the page, it's just helpful um, to know that it's a universal experience. So absolutely, I think that it can provide support and you know um, these books are, are great for that but also then create a community of support by perhaps having an online community I know there's you know um, with cancer Vixen, and she's done a lot of uh, charity work and kind of created a community online with that book as well Ian we have you back now do you want to add to Sorry that? about that I lost okay. 
I lost the last five minutes there. Well, um, we were talking about uh, using these graphic novels, particularly these cancer graphic novels, not with cancer patients in mind necessarily, but for their community in better preparing them, comforting them, informing them. Do you see that as a uh, important, helpful, salient use uh, of this material? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think because, well, particularly with autobiographical works, um, because the viewpoint is so personal, um, um, I kind of think that they're, they're definitely of use to, to um, you know, carers and, and everybody surrounding uh, the person who has who's going through the illness experience. Um, I'm not sure. I didn't sort of hear what MK said. So I might well, let me expand upon that. Sense. Would these works be more useful than, say, a film on cancer or than, say, a prose novel on cancer? What does this medium in particular uh, do that the other media might not? Well, I think it's a very rich media. I wouldn't put it above other media. Um, I think that it just sort of broadens um, the choice, if you like, of, of the way that people can kind of absorb stories or um, uh, relate or, you know, um, can sort of absorb this material. Um, some people like reading prose, some people like watching film or TV, some people like reading comics. So I wouldn't say that it's better than a film or better than a TV program or better than a prose novel. I think they all have their place. I would, I just see comics as sort of being equal to those. Um, and um, as, as comics become more, as, as culture, I guess, and people become more visually adapted. I mean, we're living in a, a very visually rich culture. Uh, we're all kind of, you know, looking at more images rather than reading texts now. Um, I, I think that comics will go from strength to strength and, and, you know, more people are reading comics now. So it gives them that option. Um, one, one subject we've been wrestling with in the class, and again, as I prefaced at the outset, this class has been largely an exploration. We've been talking about whether there is a relationship, a linkage, uh, between cancer as a topic and comics as a medium. Now, I agree with what you said. Comics should not be put above uh, any other uh, of, of the media. Uh, but is there something inherent to comics that can uh, shed more light on the cancer experience? We haven't come to a concrete answer on that, but we have been exploring the possibilities there. Which is not a question, which was just an outright statement. Let me get to the next student question. Uh, this next question comes from Jacob Fielkowski. Uh, Fielkowski excuse me. Uh, his first question is, is in line with the previous two, but then he explores it more fully. Uh, a couple of questions for you both. Thank you. First, with graphic medicine being something that is gaining traction, what do you feel will push it forward in popularity? So again, the same future focus. And I, I should mention you have another of your conferences coming up uh, in Glasgow, am I correct? Uh, shortly. Dundee. Yeah, Dundee, Dundee, Dundee excuse me. nearby. Uh, he goes further, though. Do you feel it will be through instructors, such as Professor Lewis, or do you feel individuals will seek out this material on their own, creating a greater interest in the content. So what do you see the vehicle, I guess, being of graphic medicine? Is it going to uh, more likely come from uh, pedagogy, from instructors uh, taking it on? Or do you think that there's a grassroots groundswell, as Ian, I think you may have been alluding to this earlier, of people coming to comics uh, more and more. I think both. Um, I think that comics appeal to the grass, to a you know a grassroots demographic. Um, mm -hmm. We, when we've thought about you know what graphic medicine is, and we haven't um, 
uh, when we've thought about the possibility of like formalizing um, our you know group of people as some sort of organization we've kind of resisted because we kind of like the slightly anarchic kind of uh, very um, egalitarian sort of um, principles on which it's built up um, in which kind of ev anybody can contribute and and uh, you know it's not grounded in institutions it's kind of out there in the community and it's the community that 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 sort of inform the inform the conversation if you like um recently when we put out a call for for um testimonials um we asked people to to tell us how graphic medicine helps them or how they've used it or what they think of it so that we could put these testimonials together for a grant application um and we were kind of um we were uh, it was great we got a, just such a broad um array of of you know material back and and people from all kinds of backgrounds from educational institutions healthcare practitioners comic makers or people that just like reading comics or people that have been through similar um through similar experiences to some of the comics they've read um and it was just very broad and um i think it will spread by like word of mouth recommendation from the an organic approach up, but also people like yourself um which is a very p important part of the process i mean it's, it's very um exciting for us to have people you know start teaching kind of courses on it um and i think that's an important um you know aspect as well and that sort of will also lend it some um uh, you know um uh, it will kind of give it a gravitas within institutions and, and some of the uh, say people who would be less likely to take up comics within educational institutions might then sort of see what you're doing and, and uh, have a further look at it and get into it. And that's partly what I hope video Q&As like this uh, also lend themselves to, uh, a record that people can access uh, and become familiar in yet another way. I want to move to MK because the second part of Jacob's question is specifically for you, MK, and it's on your essay, uh, your chapter in uh, the Graphic Medicine Manifesto, The Crayon Revolution. Um, Jacob asks, do you feel that a lack of artistic experience is a deterrent? for people who wish to pursue graphic medicine? And if so, how do you feel this obstacle should be tackled? Now, I, I will say for people unfamiliar or haven't had read uh, MK's essay recently, I believe it's safe to say you're encouraging people of all perceived skill levels, uh, especially in a classroom setting, but even outside a classroom setting, to jump into art, that the crayon is the great a uh, field leveler, and that what we call, if I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, MK, what we call talent in many cases, at least in uh, elementary K through 12 education, is actually just the ability to uh, represent realistically uh, images that we see about us, but that may be a improper measure or a less useful measure than encouraging everyone to express themselves through art regardless of perceived level. I, I didn't mean to answer the question for you, but I wanted to give enough context there. So what do you say to Jacob's question about um, whether lack of artistic experience should be a deterrent, or if not a deterrent, how should it be overcome? Right. Um, so as I say in the chapter, I think I say in the chapter, um, so around fourth grade we get our words. We now are literate, so we're discouraged from continuing to draw. Um, and as you said, the only people who are encouraged to continue are people who allegedly have talent, which apparently at that point means photorealism. Mm -hmm. But we all weren't um, Shakespeare. We all weren't capable of writing, you know, a proper form sonnet, but yet we all continued to use words. We weren't told because we didn't have talent in the writing arts, we couldn't do it. That was the whole point of our education was to teach us how to use it. Um, but yet, somehow, we are not continued to be taught how to use art unless you have some predisposition to it, which is just silliness. Um, because if you think about it, 
the only kind of art, you know, we have a lot more kinds of art than just photorealistic art, right? There's a lot of different um, ways to express oneself creatively. So um, the point of it is, I think, from my experience, what I sort of try to carry forward is that when I was in a difficult moment, even though I was not the kid who could draw, I was not the kid who was told, no, I was a kid who was told to put your crayons down and use your words, yeah. but you know, when I was 33 years old, I was in a difficult situation as a nurse and in a caregiver during the AIDS crisis, and I, de I kind of out of desperation turned to drawing, and it worked, and it was helpful for me, and particularly the, the comics form, because there is this grid of sequential images and a little bit of text and a little bit of image. And I think the, the, what I'm driving at is that the medium itself is incredibly powerful for organizing thoughts and presenting information. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think about a lot is that comics are incredibly useful when information density is high, the need to comprehend is high, and there's, uh, you know, a, a high level of emotional experience, uh, anxiety, frustrations, sadness, fear. Um, comics are especially helpful in drawing and in reading during those times, and if you think about it, that's a healthcare experience, has all of those three elements. Um, high density of information, you're diagnosed with something, all of a sudden there's a whole new world of terms and treatments and decisions, it's all open up to you. Those are high stakes decisions and you're anxious about it. So, you know, it's a great time for comics. But, yeah, it has nothing to do with whether or not you can draw. It has much more to do with processing the experiences and, and organizing your thoughts and, and processing them. And, um, you know, you may not be making comics that anyone else sees. That may not necessarily be the reason that you're doing them. Um, I have a whole set of journal comics that are about difficult caregiving situations that will never see the light of day. But I did them because of the fact that I know that they're helpful as a as a method, like you writing in a journal, kind of perhaps. Um, so that's just you know I have a million thoughts in that regard, but that's just a few that I hope answer the question. I, it, it does, and in fact, I'm I'm noticing. I don't know if this is happy accident. I don't know if this is my own bias, and I don't know if this is. Um, uh, something inherent in the nature of cancer comics, but I'm noticing that nearly all of the texts that I either assigned or made optional this semester, nearly none of them can be considered uh, realistic representational drawing. From, as you mentioned, Cancer Vixen, uh, I'm even looking at Seeds by Ross McIntosh, and these are not photorealistic images of Ross McIntosh uh, and his father, even in the case of uh, a superhero text like The Death of Captain Marvel, uh, this is still highly stylized, right? This is not uh, necessarily even accurate human anatomy. It is the superhero uh, anatomy and the way clothing works on a superhero. Looking at the bookshelf back here, uh, the, story, uh, the story of my tits or terminally ill in uh, the Buzzkill, a webcomic online, Cancer Owl, another webcomic online, all of these seem to be taking good advantage of ex precisely what you pointed out, that, that the art does not have to be in lockstep with our perception of reality. And there's some theory behind that. I, I don't know if mm -hmm. you looked at Scott McCloud's book, mm -hmm. Understanding Comics, but remember that... Uh, that panel that he shows us, you know, the simple smiley face on one side and the very photorealistic drawing on the other side of a spectrum, you're much more likely to be able to, as a reader, insert yourself into that narrative the less photorealistic the drawing is. He universalizes it. Exactly. We have a greater something. chance of seeing ourselves in it. Exactly. What the, I think it's, um, I, I, think, I don't think this comes from literary scholars. I forget where it comes from, but one of our colleagues at Johns Hopkins has talked about narrative transportation theory, which is basically the ability to insert yourself in the story and that you are become part of the story as a reader. Uh, in fact, and Ian, I don't know if you want to add to this. I'm just looking at the cover and at the art uh, that's included in Graphic Medicine uh, Manifesto. And we have you, or a representation of you, MK and uh, Ian, uh, is this you? Am I correct? No, no. I'm Where are you? <laughs> I had shorter hair then. Oh, uh, shorter hair. Okay, excuse me. Bottom, bottom right. Bottom right. Okay, very good. Um, but the, my reason for pointing this out is these characters may be more approachable, may be more universal than necessarily a photograph 
of either of you, or or um, even a live video. Now, I don't mean to be shooting myself in the foot by doing a live video with you and saying that it's less approachable than your book, uh, but video gives us an almost real representation uh, of real life. Obviously, we're not all sitting in Ian's lap right now, as much as it may look that way. Um, and here we have a less than realistic, but again, more uh, egalitarian, more inviting representation of each of you. Do you want to speak to that, Ian, and what went into representing each of you this way? Well, uh, I guess the way that we're represented in the Graphic Medicine Manifesto is, is a sort of function of how MK and I draw, which is fairly simple, I guess, and colourful. And we try to meld our um, styles into one. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they're cartoony representations. Um, you can, you know, they're simplified. Um, I'm sure they are more approachable than... I, I, I'd hate to see what the book would look like if we put photographs of ourselves in it. It would just look ridiculous somehow. But um, it, it's, it's... So for that reason, I guess, you know, we can do it with cartoons, uh, with comics. We can put ourselves in there. We can... Uh, one, of the, one of the ideas of the book was to make it a very personal book and was to sort of, um, if you like, challenge traditional academic... Um, academic um, rules um, whereby you know the author should be invisible um, some people when writing academic uh, pro, uh, academic text don't even like to use the word I um, so we, no we a noted this in the class how, how nearly all of the chapters practically all the chapters begin with the author's personal experience you all seem to give a background either on your experience with comics or any bias that you're bringing in before launching into what we would loosely call the scholarly material. Right, yeah. that was very intentional. Yeah, it was, and it, and it was to, to explode that illusion that, that academic writing is somehow unbiased and sort of, you know, objective and sort of coolly kind of dispassionate about things we all just sort of jumped in there and said look we're, we're really into comics we're comics advocates you know we're evangelical about this um, that's where we're coming from um, and then we put pictures of ourselves in there as well and as I say you know the cartoons work uh, and make hopefully a sort of engaging whereas it would just be a bit ridiculous to put photos of ourselves well let's have you preach a little bit more we have three more student questions <clears throat> in the time that we have left and I'm going to go to Sarah Ketchum uh, who asked uh, dear Mr. Williams and uh, Ms. Uh, Surrey ha I have seen some physicians dismiss occupational therapy as, oh, what will coloring do? She has that in quotes. And I should mention the, the students that we're engaging with here are uh, at MCPHS. They are focused on healthcare, pharmacy, administration, counseling, pre-med. So they have some access to physicians in the field. Sarah's question, therefore, is how should graphic medicine begin to be incorporated into general practice without the stipulation that the person is mentally ill. So I think what Sarah is getting at there is how do we apply graphic medicine to a patient without insulting uh, the patient, that this is some uh, juvenile task or this is some lesser cognitive task. How do you overcome uh, potential patient bias uh, in uh, inviting them to this practice. I see what you, but, but you mean by giving them a comic, you're kind of patronizing them in some way. Or... Either by giving them a comic or asking them to engage in making their own comic or in just uh, meditative coloring therapy. How do we uh, override uh, what might be patients' own biases with the medium? Well, you give them the option yeah. to do it or not do it, and you tell them how cool comics are and how how they're the next big thing and everybody's doing. It. I mean, you know, um, you can, you know, I, I think, you know, you how how do we promote comics uh, uh, without ramming them down people's throats? And um, you know, they 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 gradually will become more acceptable as people see them used. Um, they can be 
offered as options, I guess. Um, um, it, it's a, it is a real problem with the, you know, the the stigma attached to comics, uh, and they've often been used um, well-meaningly um, in situations where where you're dealing with a demographic who are perceived to have low literary skills. Wow. Um, you know. Um, and people have sort of thought, well, that you know, those type of people mm -hmm. uh, can't read very well, so give them a comic because kids can read comics. So that's about their reading level. As you and I know, comics are far more kind of complex and rich, and uh, nothing to do with kind of reading age or whatever. They're um, dual channeled. They're full brained. They are uh, immersive. They yeah. are, as you said, rich. Um, but uh, let me also lend this over to MK. Aside from assigning comics or offering comics, and I think Ian rightly named, we can't force them on anyone, what about the creation of comics? Uh, having patients or healthcare workers, either one, I think the student here is focusing on patients, uh, having them engage in comics creation, how do you overcome the barrier there of feeling sheepish, juvenile, uh, or in some other way insulted? Well, I think, you know, creating comics in a clinical realm with patients is the, is the work of art therapists. And mm -hmm. I think art therapists are very, you know, this isn't the work that Ian or I do. Um, art therapists are well trained in, you know, as in any therapy, getting you to engage in a modality that perhaps at first you might not fully understand whether it's talking out loud about your problems or drawing or whatever a couple of things come to mind one is I think I quote this in my chapter in the manifesto something that Linda Berry once said is that if a four-year-old won't draw we worry but if a 40-year-old won't draw we don't right. why right like that's really there's no good reason there's no good answer to that question I mean um, so, so that's something, uh, and I, again, I think it's the work of art therapists, um, and we're starting to see more art therapists kind of join our ranks. But interestingly, you know, one of the things that comics has at its service is the power of narrative, and one of the, the whole reason I studied medical humanities and bioethics was to look at the role of story in healthcare. And assembling a story around, and there's a lot of theory about that by people like Arthur Frank and Rita Sharon and the narrative medicine movement. The story does very particular things in healthcare, um, and the the role of the narrative is to help you. One of the things Art Frank, Arthur Frank, particularly writes about is to help you kind of, um, you know, you've got yourself before diagnosis and the life narrative you had. And then this thing happens, this diagnosis, this realization that you have this, and your whole life narrative has changed because it now involves treatment, it now involves wow. different outcomes. And one of the things story can do in healthcare in assembling your story is to help you kind of move that forward, to help you understand this new world, and then also create a vision for yourself in the future. You, you, know, you, knew, you thought you knew where your life was going, but this thing happens, and you have to adapt and story in healthcare helps us with that and comics have that at their service but I just the last thing I want to say is what we find most most interesting most interesting to me what we find from people presenting to us about the area uh, area of healthcare in which comics are most frequently being used with patients is with veterans who have experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, James Sturm is doing that at the Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont. Um, there are a lot of programs where veterans, in fact, you can even read about it, particularly in the Doonesbury series, the Gary Trudeau, not making comics, but the way that story, when you've had a traumatic event, reassembling your own story is the work you need to do. And especially in a trauma where you have just flashes of images, that what comics can do is help you put those images in panels and create that story as it moves forward and literally be assembling, doing that work that Arthur Frank talks about of reassembling your story and figuring out how it moves forward. That's fascinating and I, I can absolutely see uh, the applications there. Um, Ian, of course, touched upon uh, something that is entirely understandable. We cannot force patients uh, to engage in a therapy or to engage in a prospect 
against their will. And this touches one of my uh, students' comments here. This comes from Jenny Chen asking, first of all, saying thank you for taking the time to take questions from our class. I have a couple of questions for you two. The first one being, and this is coming from us reading so many texts. <laughs> what did I say? What did I do? Um, this is coming, uh, I'll just back it up. This is coming from our having read so many cancer narratives. She wants to know, do you believe that cancer treatments are ethical? And when she asks this, she was getting in, we were talking about Sidney Farber. And we were talking about the early treatment of cancer patients with the placebo being given to one set of cancer patients and experimental uh, experimental cocktails of chemotherapies being given to other patients. This brought up a real ethical dilemma uh, for the students that in attempting to progress the field of medicine and find new remedies, solutions, ameliorative uh, possibilities, that it's also going to cost lives or, or not save lives necessarily in the interim. Do you, either of you have a particular position on that, on the ethics of experimental treatments? Um, well, you've got to separate research from recommended treatments, I, I suppose. So, you know, healthcare is constantly being uh, pushed forward and sort of new innovations are coming out. And obviously, mm -hmm. then those new treatments need to be tested and there's a whole kind of there are various tiers of clinical trials um, which are tightly controlled from a kind of an ethical point of view I mean it's you know uh, all clinical trials have to go through kind of like a thorough ethical examination and sort mm -hmm. of uh, ethical uh, scrutiny um, but I think the students, or Jenny and, and some of the students, were really wrestling, and maybe for the first time in their academic careers, wrestling with the idea that if we are going to have ethical uh, experiments and ethical treatments, it will include a control group who may not yeah. be helped at all. Uh, yeah. And I think that was jarring to them, uh, especially in the context of the stories that we were reading were these characters, these people that they were coming to care about, were they actually getting the experimental, uh, helpful treatment, or were they being held unknowingly in control? And that tension sat very uh, ill at ease with them. Um, I, I mean, I guess nowadays people go into um, clinical trials fully knowing that they are entering a clinical trial. I mean, you know, if people are diagnosed with cancer now and offered treatment, they will be offered, generally offered the standard treatment of what is available now. They might be given the option of going into a clinical trial, which may be different treatment or, up, you know, above and beyond what they're having now. But they will, I mean, this should all be explained to them. But yes, um, some people will be desperate and uh, go into a trial um you know, not knowing whether they're going to get the active treatment or a placebo or an, or a, an alternative treatment. I mean, the the, the converse is that um, somebody might be getting a, a control treatment, and the uh, trial treatment might turn out to have several terrible side effects that they don't get. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, these are complex issues, uh, and hopefully, kind of have improved over time. Um, there's I, a, I've you know. I'd raise the point that they, you are absolutely correct. They're complex issues that um, I'm gratified that if they're just now entering students' consciousness, that they're doing it this way, that this class and this examination is bringing uh, overall healthcare concerns or overall medical treatment concerns uh, to the forefronts of their minds, and it's happening through comics and area. Yeah, I, I think that's I think absolutely right. Yeah, and that's what they're in these kinds of classes to start grappling with and asking those questions and realizing that the ethics of healthcare are very complex. And I think, uh, I, I think ethics aside, the whole, um, you know, when uh, patients have a cancer diagnosis, the whole set of, uh, if you like, um, decisions that they have to make are so 
incredibly complex. Yes. Um, you know, they've been sort of handed a sort of devastating diagnosis, and then they're sort of um, you know uh, presented with you know options, if you like, at a moment when they're most vulnerable. I think sort of certain cancer narratives in comics are, are good at sort of showing showing this up, just the sort of the, the confusing. Um, uh, sequence of events that people are thrust into um, right. and I think that you know uh, comics is an ideal way of representing this in its in all of its complexity thank you for bringing up sorry go ahead MK no I'm just gonna say and then the other amazing thing for the ways in which you know I teach medical students and, and many of our colleagues and, and Ian we teach medical students these texts are created by, like for example, Brian's book uh, and Marissa's book, they're created by people living with those real experiences. And that's really powerful. And when we use those as tools for medical students, it's bringing the full lived experience of illness to the service of the conversation rather than a medical student coming through thinking these issues aren't really very complex as they march out or that they're the authority that if they can be reading these books that so appealingly present to them the full picture, they can have a more nuanced and complex understanding of the lived experience of illness and the difficult positions we often put our patients in. Let me uh, just add one more layer to that. Even when we have a fictional account uh, of a cancer battle, I, this semester we looked at the death of Captain Marvel. Uh, next week I'll be speaking with uh, writer Mark Wade about why he incorporated a cancer plot line into his run on Daredevil. It's still informed by people having real life experiences of loved ones with cancer, uh, the ubiquity of cancer, and what they've had to engage in their real life, even if it becomes fictionalized and placed uh, at, a, at a slight remove. Uh, with with a fictional character. In fact, we could further argue that uh, even mom's cancer, even cancer made me a shallower person. Uh, are we getting a semi-fictionalized autobiographical version or biographical version of the person? Are we ever getting uh, the actual person, or are we getting a mediated version? Uh, that's a, a narrative theory question. That's a literary theory question that we could discuss. Uh, all day long. How much of autobiography is true, how much of it feels true, how much of it is a representation. It leads to the second part of Jenny's question and then one more question uh, from Sun Do. The second part of Jenny's question, do you believe that comics are able to bring an honest representation to the intense treatments patients endure or do they mask the true nature of cancer treatments through drawings? Now. I'm going to link that with the uh, final question we have here. If you could just hold that, put a pin in that. Uh, are these portrayed truly, honestly, I think is the question. Sun Do asks, have you thought about making, uh, I think it is referring here to graphic medicine, have you thought about making it graphic medicine extremely graphic and morbid in order to really get the gravity of the situation across or do you think there is a limit before the point and the lessons of the manifesto might get misconstrued? So we have students who are, I think, wrestling with how real should these be? And is there a point at which reality uh, does a disservice? That there is something about the representational nature of comics holding it at a distance that helps or that mediates? Would either of you like to speak to that? Shall I go on that? Because I, I write a bit about that in the manifesto. Yes, so you do. I, I kind of feel it's the, well, those are sort of questions that individual authors, are, you know, can decide um, in creating their own work. Um, I mean, what I really like about autobiographical comics in particular is that they're not made um, in general. They're, they're not made for any particular agenda other than the author's agenda. Yeah. Um, some of them do uh, lapse into kind of educational or explanatory sort of essays within the works, but but I kind of really like the way that they, you know, the, the power is in the hands of the author, if you like, and they may choose, like I say in the manifesto, they may choose like David Small to portray their kind of wounds very 
uh, graphically and realistically, or like Kaiser Lecca in uh, I'm Not These Feet, um, they hold the the reader at bay by portraying themselves as uh, in a very simplified form as a, as a mouse. So I don't think that there is a, I, I think that if people want to produce extremely graphic work, um, that will serve one purpose and there will be an audience for that. Um, the readers will choose whether or not to engage with that. Um, if people want to, uh, if people find that, that their way of kind of making comics is to simplify things and to not, um, if, if you like sort of being too graphic may uh, complicate matters, you know, maybe it's sort of simpler to, to not show everything, uh, but to show, um, not to make it too gory, but to kind of uh, strive for a kind of an emotional truth never is, nevertheless if you is like. it fair to say that neither one is wrong but they will serve as you say different purposes they will have different yeah. effects simplification yeah. versus uh, photorealistic graphic neither one is a step in the wrong direction neither one is prohibited but the effect they have will lead to an alternate purpose and if I could just pick up on that again I mean you were you mentioned, you know, like about autobiographical tr um, works, you know, how true are they? How true is autobiography? What, you know, where does autobiography meet fiction? I mean, if we're thinking visually, um, you could pose similar questions about sort of representations of uh, wounds or, or medical treatment, because you know, when I was a medical student, we learned mostly from textbooks and that we're, some textbooks had photos in, some textbooks had drawings in. Um, in real life, um, when you're presented uh, with, you know, like during an operation or something and you're looking inside somebody's body, it looks like neither. It looks like, it doesn't look like either the drawing or the photo. Neither right. of them are very... Um, very accurately representative, if you like, because they're mediated. Uh, there's a need to give accurate, there's a need to sort of um, give, say, surgeons in training uh, an idea of the anatomy while sort of make, simplifying it and making it clear by getting rid of all the blood that's spurting around and um, standardizing things. So, you know, visual representations in themselves are, are not very true or maybe they are very true, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very, you know, it's a complex question. It's not straightforward. It is. Um, no, it absolutely is. MK, was this uh, any factor you had to address when uh, creating your own graphic novel? What level of reality to include, how graphic to be, what effect either approach might have? Absolutely. I mean, I, I you know, I was working on a book that represented a disease that was quite gory. Um, but, and I remember early on when I was speaking at an event uh, in the gay community in Chicago, one of the people in the audience asked me, are you going to show how horrible it was in terms of, you know, the patients being so cachectic or some of the things that early on Kaposi sarcoma could do to people's appearance. Um, you know, some of the, the swelling that was just, I mean, beyond thing you see in so many other areas of, of healthcare that it, AIDS particularly was very gory. Yeah. And I thought about that a lot. And I also thought about representing the community and the experience. And I thought that I, I really was struggling with that for a while thinking, but that's not my style. My style is like childlike and goofy. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, I struggled with creating this book in my head for a long time before I put pen to paper. And one of the things I came to realize that, first of all, is that I can't tell my patient's story. You know, again, I, I studied ethics because I wanted to look at the ethics of a healthcare provider representing their patients. I can't tell anyone else's story but my own. So, first of all, I personally wasn't experiencing gore. I was a caregiver. Um, right. I mean, I was bearing witness to it, but it wasn't my gore. But the point is, uh, I ended up realizing that I could only speak to my own truth and that what I wanted to do was to um, represent that experience in my own style, which is what I have to work with. That's fabulous. No, no, that's, that's actually, uh, it's commendable, actually, in, in its own way, not altering 
either your message or your approach for the sake of an unknown audience, for the sake of an imagined audience, but rather going uh, to the core of your work in a way that suits you. Um, right, and those images are available elsewhere. You know, there are documentaries. There are different ways you can access what that imagery was like. Mm -hmm. um, there's something else I hope my book can bring. Excellent. Uh, MK, Ian, I want to thank you both uh, for taking the time to talk with me today. I want to encourage uh, people who might be listening to this, who might have heard about uh, this discussion, to please check out graphicmedicine.org, uh, as well as Ian and MK's uh, individual works. They are doing just such sensational um, uh, investigations and uh, drawing such incredible connections beyond just cancer in comics, the focus here to all of uh, healthcare, illness, and the human experience. So I want to thank you uh, both, Ian from the road uh, on the way to Manchester, uh, MK in Chicago, and uh, let me just leave it to say that next week we'll be speaking with Mr. Mark Wade about his run on Daredevil and his incorporation of a cancer storyline to secondary character Foggy Nelson. MK, Ian, thank you very much again. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us. Thanks. Take care.